Hello, I am Professor Sims, and this video is about circulatory and lymphatic system infections. This is the ninth of ten lessons included in my pathogenic microbiology course. If you are currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and Moodle site for assignments and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include describing major anatomical features of circulatory and lymphatic systems. We'll explain why circulatory and lymphatic systems lack normal microbiota. We'll describe general signs and symptoms of disease associated with infections in the circulatory and lymphatic systems. Uh, we'll be identifying and comparing bacteria that most commonly cause infections of the circulatory and lymphatic systems. We'll identify common viral pathogens that cause infections of the circulatory and lymphatic system. And finally, we'll look at common parasites that cause infections of the circulatory and lymphatic system. The circulatory system includes the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system. The cardiovascular system consists of the heart, blood, and blood vessels. Infection and inflammation of the cardiovascular system frequently causes cardiac and vascular disease. The lymphatic system consists of lymph, lymphatic vessels, lymphatic tissue, and lymphatic organs. The lymphatic system returns excess tissue fluid back to the cardiovascular system, and the relationship between the cardiovascular and lymphatic systems is illustrated in the upcoming figures. The major components of the circula circulatory system deliver blood to the body's organs and tissues. So this is showing the heart, the arter arteries, veins, and capillaries. It's also showing how oxygenated blood leaves the lungs and enters the heart, and how deoxygenated blood from the lower body is moved to the lungs so that it can become oxygenated. Figure 25.4 is showing how blood enters the capillaries from the arterial. The arterial is shown in red here, and it leaves through the venules, which is shown here in blue. And then interstitial fluids are draining into the lymph capillaries. This is shown in green here, and proceeds to the lymph nodes. Figure 25.3 is showing the essential components of the human lymphatic system, and it's also showing how the human lymphatic system drains fluid away from tissues and returns it to the cardiovascular system. Once microorganisms gain access to either one of these systems, they can spread throughout the body and therefore have the potential to infect any organ system. Because their symptoms are so similar to those of other diseases, many bacterial infections of the circulatory and lymphatic systems are often difficult to diagnose. In general, bacterial and fungal infections affect the endocardium, causing endocarditis. The endocardium is the tissue lining the heart chambers. Viral and parasitic infections usually affect the myocardium, and this is called myocarditis. The myocardium is the heart muscle itself. And then uh, inflammation and infection of the pericardium. The pericardium is um, the membrane that surrounds the heart, and this is called pericarditis. It's usually caused by bacteria or viruses, and very rarely it can be caused by fungi. Standard antibiotic therapies are effective for treatment of most bacterial infections of the circulatory system, unless the bacteria is resistant, of course, in which case synergistic treatment may be required. Infections of the circulatory system may occur after a break in the skin barrier, via entry into the bloodstream at the site of a localized infection, from a bite, from an arthropod vector, and it can occur in hospital settings via nosocomial infection. Pathogens or toxins in the bloodstream and lymph usually are spreading rapidly throughout the body, so these are going to be systemic, systemic and sometimes fatal infl inflammatory responses. So some examples incur include SIRS, sepsis, and endocarditis. Sepsis is the systemic response to infection and is defined as the presence of SIRS, S-I-R-S. And what this stands for is systemic inflammatory response syndrome in addition to infection. Okay, so septicemia is sepsis that occurs when bacteria multiply in the bloodstream. Septicemia is a medical emergency that requires immediate medical treatment. If the condition progresses to septic shock, the death rate is as high as 50%, depending on the type of organism involved. Septic shock is the result of hypotension, which is low blood pressure. 
uh, despite adequate fluid substitution. Septicemia develops quickly and the patient becomes extremely ill very, very quickly. Although each individual may experience symptoms differently, the most common symptoms include loss of appetite, fever, chills, lethargy, anxiety, accelerated breathing, and or accelerated heart rate. Endocarditis is an inflammation of the endocardium, the lining of the heart, or the heart valves. Endocarditis can be classified as infective if the microorganism is involved or as non-infective if there is no microorganism involved. Non-infective endocarditis involves the formation of platelet and fibrin thrombi on heart valves and the surrounding endocardium. In response to trauma, circulating immune complexes, vasculitis, or hypercoagulated state. The most common cause of infectious endocarditis is bacterial, but it can also be caused by fungi. In some cases, no causative organism can be identified. Uh, this is figure 25.6. It's showing the heart of an individual who had subacute bacterial endocarditis of the mitral valve. Bacterial vegetations are visible on the valve tissue. Infections of the lymphatic system cause lymphangitis and lymphadenitis. Infectious lymphangitis occurs when bacteria or viruses enter the lymphatic channels. They may enter through a cut or a wound, or they may grow from an existing infection. The most common infectious cause of lymphangitis is acute streptococcal infection, and it may also be the result of staphylococcal infection. Lymphadenitis is the medical term for inflamed and enlarged lymph nodes. It is usually due to an infection. Lymph nodes are filled with white blood cells that help your body fight infection. And when the lymph nodes become infected themselves, it's usually because an infection started somewhere else in your body and then traveled to the lymph. Bacterial infections of the circulatory and lymphatic system are almost universally serious infections. Left untreated, most have very high mortality rates. The systemic immune response to bacteriosema, which involves the release of excess amounts of cytokines, can sometimes be more damaging to the host than the infection cell. Sepsis, purpural fever, rheumatic fever, endocarditis, gas gangrene, osteomyelitis, and toxic shock syndrome are typically a result of injury injury or introduction of bacteria by medical or surgical intervention, plague, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and Lyme disease, these all spread via pneumonia and or vector transmission. Gangrene is a complication of necrosis. Uh, necrosis is the decay and death of tissue that is often related to wounds. If the blood supply to a tissue is interrupted by an infection, that's when gangrene can occur. Gangrene mostly affects the extremities. However, it can also occur in muscle tissue and organs. Enzymes released from dying cells and tissue further destroy surrounding tissues, and that provides the perfect nutrient environment for many bacterial species. Several species of the genus Clostridium, which are gram-positive endospore-forming anaerobes grow easily under these conditions. Clostridium is commonly found in soil as well as in the intestinal tract humans and even in domestic animals. The most frequent species involved in gangrene is Clostridium perfringens. In this image of a patient with gas gangrene, note the bluish purple discoloration around the bicep. So this is here what they're talking about. The bluish color um, surrounding the bicep in the irregular margin of the discolored tissue indicating the spread of infection. On the right here, this is showing a radiograph of the arm and it shows a darkening in the tissue which indicates the presence of gas. Treatment of gangrene usually entails the removal of the necrotic tissue and in many cases and probably this case uh, amputation may be necessary. Osteomyelitis is an infection of bone. Symptoms may include pain in a specific bone with overlying redness, fever, and weakness. The long bones of the arms and legs are the most commonly infected, especially in children, while uh, the feet, the spine, and hips are most commonly infected in adults. The cause is usually a bacterial infection, but sometimes, rarely, it can be a fungal infection. It may occur by spread from the blood or from surrounding tissue 
issue. Risks for developing osteomyelitis include diabetes, intravenous drug use, prior removal of the spleen, and trauma to the area. Bones can become infected in a number of ways. Infection in one part of the body may spread throughout the bloodstream and into the bone. Uh, an open fracture or surgery may expose the bone to infection, for example. Uh, treatment usually involves antimicrobials and surgery, and in those with poor blood flow, amputation may be required. Treatment outcomes are generally good with this condition, especially if it's only been present for a short period of time. The plague is an infectious disease caused by Yersinia pestis, a gram-negative, rod-shaped bacterium. People usually become infected when bitten by a flea that carries the bacteria from an infected rodent or by handling an infected animal. After the flea bite, the bacteria enter the bloodstream and proliferate in the limb and the blood. Yersinia pestis can reproduce within cells, therefore even if phagocytosed, they still survive. Once the organism enters the limb, it causes swelling of lymph nodes, especially in the groin and in the armpit. These swellings are referred to as buboes, which is where the name bubonic plague originated from. Because the lymph is delivered to the subclavian veins via the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct, it ultimately enters the bloodstream, and the bacteria within the lymph are now capable of multiplying in the blood, causing septicemia, uh, septicemic plague, and then that's followed by septic, septic shock. Septicemic plague can occur when bacteria enter the bloodstream directly through a flea bite or as a complication of the bubonic or pneumonic plague. All forms of the plague can be treated with antibiotic in its early stages. But if untreated, septicemic plague is universally fatal. Figure 2510 is showing buboes in the groin of an infection, infected patient here. And then over here, it's showing the necrotic toes of a patient that has septicemic plague. Rocky Mountain spotted fever is caused by rickettsia, an obligate intracellular pleomorphic gram-negative bacterium. Rickettsia is transmitted to humans by ticks. In contrast to its name, it occurs throughout the United States, not just in the Rocky Mountains. It's a severe disease, and it's most frequently reported of it's the most frequently reported of the rickettsia illnesses. The incubation period for Rocky Mountain spotted fever varies from about 5 to 10 days after a tick bite, and there's non-specific symptoms that may resemble a variety of other infectious diseases. So again, it's difficult to diagnose, especially in the early stages. The initial symptoms may include fever, nausea, vomiting, severe headache, muscle pain, lack of appetite, and rash. Later signs include abdominal pain, joint pain, and diarrhea. The characteristic rash is usually not seen until about day 6 or 7. Only 35 to 60 percent of patients even develop this rash, and 50 to 80 percent of these show the rash on the, only on the palms or the soles of their feet. And about Antibiotic treatment should be given immediately, even before laboratory confirmation of diagnosis is obtained. The most commonly used antibiotics are tetracycline and chlorophenicol. Despite treatment, about 3 to 5 percent of persons developing fever still end up dying from the condition. Figure 2513 shows the rash associated with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Unlike epidemic or murine typhus, the rash begins at the hands and wrists and then spreads to the trunk of the body. Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, a gram-negative modal spirochete that is transmitted to humans by the bite of an infected black-legged tick. The infection in humans presents itself in three stages. Typical early symptoms include skin rash, often resembling a bullseye. Also, they have you have fever, fatigue, headache, stiff neck, and muscle pain. In most cases, the early stages of Lyme disease are uh, successfully treated by administration of antibiotics for a few weeks. The second stage of Lyme disease may occur weeks to months later if the condition is untreated. The infection then can 
spread to the joints, then to the heart and nervous system, causing symptoms that include severe fatigue, skin lesions, heart failure, meningitis, and even encephalitis. The third stage of Lyme disease results in repeated and severe attacks of arthritis over many years. Figure 25.14 shows the two-year life cycle of the black-legged tick, the biological vector of Lyme disease. And then uh, figure 25.15 is showing the characteristic bullseye rash of Lyme disease. This is the photo here on the left. And then on the right here, it's showing a dark field micrograph of Borrelia burgdorferi, the causative agent of Lyme disease. This black-legged tick, also known as the deer tick, is not yet attached to the skin. A notched tick extractor can be used for removal. So that's this is here. It looks almost like a little measuring spoon. To remove an attached tick with fine tip tweezers, you want to pull gently on the mouth parts until the tick releases its hold on the skin. You want to avoid squeezing the tick's body because this could release pathogens and thus increase the risk of contracting Lyme disease. Also, you want to grab it by its mouth parts and not its body because you can rip the body off and his head, his head will still be stuck in your skin. Mononucleosis, or glandular fever, is usually caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, also called the human herpes virus 4, HHV4. This is one of the most common human viruses occurring worldwide. It, if, it infects B lymphocytes, and the disease name refers to the lymphocytes with unusual lobed nuclei that proliferate during the acute infection. Many children become infected with mononucleosis, and the symptoms are indistinguishable from those of other mild illnesses of childhood. Again, it's difficult to diagnose. When an infection occurs during adolescence, it causes infectious mononucleosis about 35 to 50 percent of the time. Symptoms of mono include sore throat, fever, fatigue, swollen lymph glands, and other uh, usually mild symptoms. Although no specific treatment is available, symptoms can be treated and most patients recover within about two to four weeks. Some patients will experience fatigue for up to two months and the virus remains dormant or latent for the remainder of the person's life. Cytomegalovirus, aka the human herpes virus 5, remains mostly latent in leukocytes, such as monocytes, neutrophils, and T lymphocytes, and it replicates very, very slowly. It is spread from person to person by direct contact. The infection is usually harmless but can cause severe disease in people with a compromised immune system. The HHV5 virus can present in several bodily fluids, including urine, blood, saliva, semen, cervical secretions, and even in breast milk. Symptoms of HHV5 may include prolonged high fever, chills, severe fatigue, general malaise, headache, and an enlarged spleen. Most people that are infected do not develop these symptoms, and those who do, the symptoms will appear about 3 to 12 weeks after exposure. In fact, it's estimated that about 80% of adults in the U.S. are infected, while most have not been diagnosed, and there's no cure. Figure 2520 is showing large tumors caused by HHV4, which in addition to mononucleosis causes Burkitt lymphoma. Burkitt lymphoma affects B lymphocytes and is named after Dennis Parsons Burkitt, the Irish surgeon who first described the disease in 1958 while he was working in equatorial Africa. On the right here, you can see the characteristic irregularly shaped abnormal lymphocytes. Those are the large purple cells here with vacuoles. The vacuoles are the white spots like this one and this one, from a fine needle aspirate of tumor from a patient with Burkitt lymphoma. The overall cure rate for Burkitt lymphoma in developed countries is about 90%. Viral hemorrhagic fevers are a group of illnesses that range in severity from relatively mild to life-threatening, and they can result in severe multi-system problems. These viruses share a number of features. Uh, they are RNA viruses, either covered or enveloped. They need a natural reservoir, such as an insect host or another animal. They're geogra geographically restricted, depending on the host species. 
Humans are not the natural reservoir, however, by accidental contact, the virus can be transmitted from human to human. And human cases during outbreaks caused by these viruses are sporadic and cannot be easily predicted. Arbor, arboviral diseases such as yellow fever, dengue fever, and chinkamonga fever are characterized by high fevers and vascular damage that can often be fatal. The Ebola virus disease is a highly contagious and often fatal infection spread through contact with bodily fluids. With very few exceptions, there's no cure or treatment for viral hemorrhagic fever, and treatments for patients with yellow fever, dengue, and chikamunga, and Ebola are usually limited to supportive therapies. The viruses are scattered over much of the world, and each virus is associated with one or more specific host species. Therefore, the virus and the associated diseases are limited to the area where the host species live. Many of these viruses Viruses are present in geographically limited areas, and the risk of infection by them is restricted to those areas. Transmission to humans occurs by contact with a host, that is, by handling infected animals or their remains, or their fecal matter, urine, or secretion. Viruses associated with arthropod vectors are generally spread by mosquito or tick bites. So I've added this figure here to kind of help illustrate these viral hem hemorrhagic fevers, where they are located geographically, and also it gives you some nice um, statistics and treatment information and things like that. So have a look through that. Figure 2522 shows an Ebola virus particle as viewed with um, an electron microscope. The World Health Organization organization reported in July of 2018 that the Congo's health ministry successfully administered an experimental treatment called MAB114 for the Ebola virus, and two of the first 10 patients have recovered from Ebola. The WHO calls it a global first and a ray of hope for people with the disease. So this is big because previously there was no treatment, there's no vaccine, there's no um, cure, but we're getting there. The human immunodeficiency virus, also known as HIV, is the causative agent of acquired immune deficiency syndrome, which is known as AIDS, a second immune deficiency. AIDS is not a disease, it's not a disease, it's a syndrome because it has complex signs and symptoms and a variety of diseases are associated with common cause. AIDS results in many opportunistic infections due to a severely compromised immune system. The HIV virus basically destroys the immune system, and that leaves the body open to various infections that ultimately prove fatal. The virus targets cells of the immune system, including helper T cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, and Langerhans cells. As, as these components of the immune system battle the virus in the early stages of infection, the virus survives but may be kept in check, and the result can be almost a draw between the body and the virus, but over time, the body's ability to replace the cells of the immune system will be diminished and unable to keep up with the rapidly replicating and usually even mutating HIV virus. Without the helper T cells and macrophages, the B cells will not be stimulated to form plasma cells, and of course the plasma cells are responsible for, for producing the antibodies to fight infection. So a count of helper T cells is a good indicator in predicting the progression of infection in the onset of AIDS. Patients infected with hum human immunodeficiency virus progress through three stages of disease, which culminates in AIDS. Uh, antiretroviral therapy uses various combinations of drugs to suppress viral loads. It extends the period of latency and reduces the likelihood of transmission. Vector control and anima animal reservoir control remain the best defenses against most viruses that cause disease of the circulatory system. HIV can be spread by sexual contact, by sharing contaminated needles, by receiving any contaminated blood products, and also by a transfer from infected mother to infant, either during pregnancy, during delivery, or even through breastfeeding. This micrograph is showing HIV particles in green, all of these guys here, and they are budding from a lymphocyte, which is this blue bit back here is a lymphocyte. 
1 to 12 months post-infection, HIV antibodies appear and the patient experiences flu-like symptoms. So this is the acute HIV stage. The next stage is chronic HIV. Chronic HIV can be asymptomatic. It can last for several years, but once the CD4 or T cell count falls too low, the patient begins to experience anemia, low white blood cell count, a decrease in T cell count, seborrheic dermatitis, low cholesterol, weight loss, recurring fever, various bacterial infections, and other opportunistic infections. And this, of course, is the AIDS stage. Most patients die within two years of diagnose, diagnosis with AIDS. When HIV first enters the human bloodstream, the virus circulates throughout the body. The protective surface of HIV is studded with particular proteins called GP120, and inside is a capsid that contains the viral RNA and viral enzymes. Initially, the GP120 protein on the virus is only able to bind to a cell surface protein on the macrophage called the CD4 receptor. A second receptor protein, CCR5, must also be present on the macrophage for the virus to enter the cell by endocytosis. Viral RNA and enzymes are released into the cell's cytoplasm. Reverse transcriptase uses the viral RNA to synthesize first a strand of viral DNA and then the complementary DNA strand. The viral DNA then moves to the nucleus of the cell where it integrates into the host cell's DNA. Transcription of the DNA within the nucleus now results in the production of viral RNA. This viral RNA can serve as the genome for new viruses and can be used as messenger RNA to produce viral proteins during translation by the ribosomes. Complete viruses are assembled and released from the cell via exocytosis, which causes little harm to the macrophage. HIV cycles through macrophages over a period of years and continues to multiply while doing little apparent damage to the body. Eventually, the gene that codes for the GP120 protein is altered by mutation. The altered GP120 protein changes its co-receptor allegiance and now binds to a different co-receptor, CXCR4, which is found on the surface of CD4 plus T cells. The same processes occur within the T cells, resulting in new virus particles. However, as these new viruses leave the T cell, they rupture the plasma membrane, which kills the cell. As these newly released viruses invade and destroy other T cells, the body's immune response is weakened and this leads directly to the onset of AIDS. At present, there is no treatment that can cure an HIV infection. However, the FDA has approved more than 30 different drugs that have shown success in inhibiting or slowing the infection progress. Some of these are the integrase inhibitors, entry inhibitors, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, nucleotide analogs, protease inhibitors, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and of course combination therapy, for example, antiretroviral therapy. Malaria is one of the most common vector-borne infectious diseases. It's widespread in tropical and subtropical regions, including parts of tropical Asia, Africa, and Central and South America. Most cases of malaria reported in the United States are related to exposure from travel or military duty in areas with endemic malaria. Malaria is caused by protozoans of the genus Plasmodium. Several species in the genus Plasmodium are responsible for malaria, um, so it's not just one, it's several, several different species, and they're usually transmitted by the Anopheles mosquitoes. Plasmodium infects and destroys human red blood cells, leading to organ damage, anemia, blood vessel necrosis, and then finally death. Malaria can be treated with various anti-malarial drugs and prevented through vector control. 
All species of the malaria parasite have a similar life cycle, comprising three distinct stages, and it's characterized by alternating extracellular forms. So figure 2527 is illustrating the life cycle of plasmodium. I want you to be sure that you know these stages as well as the symptoms associated with both uncomplicated and severe malaria. So I'm going to take you through a run through. First, you have a mosquito that's taking a blood meal, and while it's doing that, it is injecting the host, in this case the human, with plasmodium. Next, you have the uh, liver cells that become infected, and that's where your plasmodium multi multiplies. Then it enters the blood, and you have reproduction and gametes that are produced by my meiosis. So this is where you have potential uh, mutations. Next, you have a mosquito, perhaps a different mosquito that is taking a blood meal and is ingesting those gametes. And then you have fertilization, you have zygote, it's reproduced by a mitosis, and you have ruptured oocytes that enter your saliva. Toxoplasmosis is a disease caused by the protozoan Toxoplasma gondii, or gondii. It's a single-celled spore-forming parasite that's found throughout the world. The organisms carry out their reproductive cycle within the members of the cat family. That is, domestic cats are the definitive host. Transmission of toxoplasmosis to humans can occur by a consumption of raw or undercooked meat, especially pork, lamb, or wild game. By consumption of untreated water via the fecal or oral route. Um, it also can come from gardening, handling cats, cleaning their litter boxes, or contaminating your hands with anything that's come into contact with cat feces. And it can go from mother to fetus, even through the organ transplant, even through blood transfusion, although this mode of transmission is rare. Figure 2530 is showing the Geisma stain Toxoplasma gondii uh, from a smear of peritoneal fluid obtained from a mouse inoculated with T. gondii and microscopic cyst, microscopic cyst containing T. gondii from a mouse brain tissue. Thousands of resting parasites, which are shown in red here, are contained in a, th in a thin parasite cyst wall. Babesiosis is a generally asymptomatic infection of red blood cells. It can cause malaria-like symptoms, especially in elderly or immunocompromised patients. It's a vector-borne illness caused by the protozoan, protozoan Babesia, and it's usually transmitted by ticks. It can cause severe illness, especially in the very young, the very old, or people with immunodeficiency. Symptoms include uh, high fever, chills, anemia, and even organ failure. Chagas disease is a tropical disease transmitted by triatomine bugs, and trypanosome infects the heart, neural tissues, monocytes, and phagocytes, often remaining latent for many years before causing serious and sometimes fatal damage to the digestive system in the heart. Chagas disease is transmitted to humans and to other mammals by insect vectors. It's and the, the vectors are currently only found in the Americas, primarily in Latin America. It's estimated that 8 to 11 million people in Mexico, Central America, and South America are infected, with most of these people not even knowing that they're infected. It is a lifelong infection, and it can be life-threatening if not treated. Figure 2532 is showing the trypanosoma cruzi protozoa that is, uh, it was in a blood smear from a patient with Chagas disease. On the right here, this is the triatomine bug, which is also known as the kissing bug or the assassin bug and he's the vector of Chagas disease. Lais maniasis is caused by the protozoan Lais mania, and it's transmitted by sand flies. It is a widespread complex disease caused by about 20 different species of sand fly. It's transmitted by female sand flies, usually in the tropics and around the Mediterranean. Although most forms of the disease are transmitted only by insects to humans, some can be spread between humans, and it's commonly found 
found in Mexico, Central America, and South America, but cases have been reported in Southern Texas, Southern Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Although treatment is available, some species have developed drug resistance. And symptoms are generally mild, but serious cases may cause organ damage, anemia, and loss of immune competence. Schistomyiasis is one of the most common parasitic infections in the world. It's caused by flukes in the genus Schistosoma. Although the Schistosoma parasites are not found in the U.S., people do become infected worldwide. In terms of impact, this disease is second only to malaria as the most devastating parasitic disease. The fluke moves throughout the body in the bloodstream and chronically infects various tissues, leading to organ damage. The main cause is contamination of water supplies with human waste. Safe and effective medication is available for treatment by Quantel, a prescription medication. And believe it or not, you only have to take it for one to two days. Figure 2533 is showing a micrograph of a tissue sample from a patient with localized cutaneous leishmaniosis. Parasit parasitic uh, leishmania mexicana is shown here. They're visible in and around the host cell. And then over here on the right, this is showing a large skin ulcer associated with this disease. This completes the Lesson 9 video for pathogenic microbiology. As always, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description below for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments section below. Thank you.